Welcome to Terrible Lizards, a podcast about dinosaurs with Dr. David Home and Izzy Lawrence. On this week's episode, we've got a brand new flappy flap for you, and it looks like Elvis. We're concentrating mainly on pterosaur growth. I hope you enjoy. Hello and welcome to another episode of Terrible Lizards. Rah, 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 rah. I am Izzy Lawrence and opposite me, as always, from Queen Mary University is Dr David Hone. This um, episode though, we're going not into the world of dinosaurs. No, we're going back to Flappy Flaps. It's a pterosaur special again, is it not, Dave? Uh, yes, because this year appears to be the year of pterosaur papers for me. <laughs> and I've got two, well, at the time of recording, I had one come out yesterday and I've got one coming out in three days, so. Amazing. It incredible not opportunity to miss. Pterosaur papers are like buses, you know. Yes. Uh, they're, they're, they're flappy and they've got loads of paper, so the actual pterosaur paper is the most onomatopoeic thing if you actually pick it up and flap it. Utterly amazing. Uh, oh, thank you so much. We've had loads of questions um, this month, so thank you so much for those. We're going to do those in the bonus episode for our patrons, so if you want to hear your questions, please do become a patron. You only need it. I think it's like a dollar a month is a minimum one, and thank you so many people who do that. That. Um, if you are desperate for audio, do you remember we got like over eighty, I think now something ridiculous episodes uh, yeah, that you can go is, and listen to. It is to. getting on. <laughs> and if it, that still isn't enough, and you don't want to be a patron, right? You could go um like for example the Stackus episode that has like the I know Dino guys or We know Dino. Is it I know Dino or We know Dino? It's I know Dino. It's I know Dino, and that they do it's, anyway. They do an amazing podcast, which is great, which keeps you up to date with all the latest dinosaur news, which we should do. But we only do this once a month now because Dave is so busy. Yes, yes, he is. <laughs> <laughs> Dave not only has two papers out in a week, but he's also just come back from Chicago. Yes, and I'm and I'm moving house in three weeks. Oh my gosh! Before oh I go to gosh. South Africa, yeah, wow. I know, I know, I don't wow. usually do this much, but here, here it is all coming in. So chaos and panic, chaos and panic. So you know, next month's um, episode might be something else. <laughs> Dave we'll has see. a breakdown. Yeah. <laughs> Dave talks about what he's found while moving. Yes. <laughs> oh, I found this old little skull of something. Anyway, anyway, the point. Point is, uh, it's be nice to Dave times, and uh, yeah, like I say, do check out other paleontology podcasts as well. I know Dino is really fun, and um, so is um, Tetsu, I think, is what we like, yeah. don't we? And yeah. Paleocast are good, and Paleocast is lovely. So, yeah, there are loads of things that you don't just need to learn from us, and but we are the best, we are the best. Dave's nodding, Dave's nodding. Yes, so we last did a special pterosaur paper about pterosaur sternum, oh. which is how weird and diverse they are, and crinkly around the edges and all sorts of nonsense so what's this latest pterosaur paper all about so this is one that was started after the pterosaur sternum but was submitted before it to the same journal and then thanks to the joys of reviews went through a lot more of a hard time getting it published than the other one did and so it's only just come out uh, so it's naming a new pterosaur oh my first one for a few years and it's a Tina Casvatid. So we've covered Tina Casvatids before for people who don't remember Tina Casvatids. They're mostly filter feeders or predators of small fish and crustaceans and stuff like that. And so basically something like gulls or various small coastal wadery animals. Is that the one which had the teeth which sort of like interlace? Is that... Lots of them do, yes. Yeah. So first of all, the name. We're, so this this is the first 15 minutes we're going to fill up going through this. The name is Petrodactyl Velnhoferi. Um, and wow. so this is linked to two very separate um, but distinct and important things in the Solnhofen. So the Solnhofen, again, for people who don't know, so where Archaeopteryx is from and a bunch of very important things and loads and loads and loads and loads and loads of pterosaurs, including the first one ever formally described. And that was a pterodactylus that was described by legendary naturalist Baron Cuvier. And when he did so, he called it initially pterodactyl. So this was a kind of nickname or, or as I talk about like anglify anglicized names like Tyrannosaur versus Tyrannosaurus. This was a Frankified name, I guess, because he's French. So he called it the Pterodactyl. And then when he formally named it, he called it Pterodactylus. 
Unfortunately, there was a typo on the cover, which is probably attributed to the printer rather than Cuvier himself, but it was typed as Petrodactyle. But of course, that actually still works as a name because it would translate a stone finger. Nice. And so that's something I've had in my mind for a few years would be nice to kind of not exactly bring it back, but like pay homage to that original study. And in this case, it's another Solenhofen Tina Kasmatid, and then Vellenhofer I named for Peter Vellenhofer, an absolute legend in terror or research pterosaurs are not a big subject even now there's a couple of dozen researchers that's the whole community here and, and even that's more than it's been for a long time and if you look back to the kind of 60s 70s 80s there were arguably one which was peter Velhofer and a few other people who were doing it uh, i mean big shout out to uh, french paleontologist eric bufto eric did probably a third to about half of his time on pterosaurs whereas Velhofer, like 90 plus percent of what he did in that window was pterosaurs. Not getting distracted by spinosaurs or any of that. No, nonsense. well, he did get distracted by Archaeopteryx because, of course, that was coming out of the same place. But no, Peter did, you know, paper after paper, enormous monographs of all the material from there. And, of course, there's so much stuff from there. And then as a result, because there weren't many people working on this stuff, important stuff from Brazil and England. He didn't really get into the China bandwagon. He'd kind of retired before that all really kicked off, though he's definitely worked on a few Chinese bits as well. And so Vellenhofer is is the pterosaur paleontologist. You know, there's there's a whole bunch of names you could bandy about for dinosaurs who kept dinosaurs going and were, you know, big forefront of that generation, the kind of 60s through 90s. For pterosaurs, it's basically Peter. And he does have a couple of pterosaurs named after him, though, to my knowledge, none ever from the Solnhofen. And so it was kind of weird, and he's been on the back of my mind for many a year, that, like, no one's ever named anything after him from a place where he spent, like, four years working and produced about half of what we still uses like the basis of modern pterosaur research should probably do that so the idea between petrodactyl velnhoferite was to really pay obviously pay homage to peter but then you know link back modern pterosaurs to the earliest papers of the late 1700s and they're all material from the same site and bloody bloody blah and here we are that was the idea well i think it's very noble of you to name a brand new species after a mistake and a forgotten man i think oh, that's... peter's not forgotten within paleontology <laughs> by any stretch no, of the imagination but, 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 the idea but it, 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 there are people who have like a dozen dinosaurs named after them who did like half the work that he did and it's just like this is silly I can't believe he doesn't have half a dozen pterosaurs named after him so damn it I'm going to do one and is this like the best of all the pterosaurs to name after him is that the is this like, is, well, is that it's what the you're first, saying it's the first one I had available because <laughs> I wanted it to be something German from or, or you know and ideally Solnhofen um, so that was really the idea behind that. Can we just um, summarise again? I know that loads of our regular listeners know about the song often and stuff, but can we just do a little sort of like brief overview of what it is? So it's a it's Lake Jurassic. It's a lagoonal system or an archipelago and series of lagoons and coral reefs. And the preservation there is exceptional because we think there was basically the very anoxic water, so no oxygen. So, you know, some bacteria were doing okay there, but very little else. And so when things got washed into this deeper water, no scab scavengers very little decay from bacteria opportunity to be buried in really soft fine-grained sediment and that gives you exceptional preservation which is why you get wings and feathers and claws and fish scales with colors and you know jellyfish and things that really don't normally jellyfish preserve is nuts that is yeah. nuts yes um, and this is all in is it all in germany or does it cross over borders a bit no no it, it's all within bavaria it's it's a fairly small region actually to be quite honest it, it's a couple of you know i guess kind of small county equivalents of Bavaria um, but they, they've been the limestone it's a limestone bed and they've been mined forever and a day for tile like the Romans used it and sent it back to Rome for tiling um, and it's still used locally there and then it was used for printing presses because they're, they're very very flat indeed which is very when you peel these layers up which is very useful but they've always contained lots of fossils and then of course eventually we realised just what kind of valuable fossils were in there so the ones that haven't been used by the Romans to tile their homes with the ones I mean, that you haven't do, been used you by do them, wonder if there's an archaeopteryx sitting in a bit of flagstone somewhere in someone's house because they just cut a big chunk out. Um, I'm, I'm told actually fairly reliably that the really fossiliferous stuff comes from the bits that aren't very good for tiles and flagstones and bricks. So that's probably not going to have happened, but you at 
least hope the possibility that, you know, someone's house falls in one day. Oh, Archaeopteryx. I mean, we still do that. I mean, if you go through like Paddington or a station in London where they've got those big slabs on the floor, you can see all sorts of little fossils. I'm constantly stopping and and spotting all kinds of stuff in those. Yeah, it's it's a very common thing. When your train's delayed, it's good. Talking about Petrodactyl Vellenhofer, right, because that's more interesting. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, So it's really quite big for a Tinocasmatid. So we get it at over two metres in wingspan. Okay. Um, and I, we, so yeah, I'm the lead author on the paper. I should say I have a couple, Rene and Bruce Lauer, and I want to talk about them extensively because they run the Lauer Foundation in Chicago, or just outside of Chicago, which is where the specimen is held. I'm going to talk about that. And Frederick Spindler, a German researcher who's been working with them and working on lots of Solnhof and stuff as well. The specimen is nearly complete. We've got nearly every bone, or at least like three quarters, seven eighths of them. Out of the ones we've got, they're mostly rather well preserved. The head's a bit squished. Uh, the upper arm bits and the shoulders are kind of in this weird, like almost rotten state where the bone kind of got messed up. But mostly it's very good. There are some spectacular fossils from the Solnhofen. It's far from the best, though it's still very good. It's definitely a long way from the worst because there's some dreadful ones out there. Uh, they're really smushed and horrible. So yeah, we, we get it at just over two metres, which really puts it in basically one of the three or four biggest things in the Solnhofen. So yeah, but bigger than our arm span. I don't know. I don't know. My arm span is two metres, I think. Even though oh, I've given it. Yeah, I'm, I'm given index. I'm, I'm yes. longer in arms than I am in um, body. Yeah, but by a bit if you're over two metres. Oh, uh, maybe. I think, I think maybe I'm over 190, I think. So I'm nearly there. Yeah. But okay. and I'm not over 190 in height. So yeah, so we, we think it, you know, it's right up there with the other biggest Solnhofen pterosaurs and would then be one of the biggest in the Jurassic anyway. So again, listeners may remember Jark that was named from Scotland just a year or two ago uh, that comes in at something like three metres and that's not even fully grown yet. Uh, incidentally, Petrodactyl isn't fully grown yet. It's definitely getting there. Some bits have fused up in the skeleton, but there's a few bits which we'd normally expect to have joined up and, and lost their suture lines if it was fully adult. Those haven't, so we think it's got a bit of growth still to go. Okay, so it's not like you don't get... Well, I, we don't know because you have so few data points, but what if you got a really flexible one? Well, it's, so we do have... <laughs> so, you know, as usual with paleontology, we have got at least got some good data set and on average we have a pretty good idea of the order in which major bones fuse together in pterosaurs there's been a couple of fairly big studies of this so you you can expect you know a b c go then d e f then g h i then j k l what of course we never do get is a b c d e f k l and j a bit and it's like, oh, so all the bottom ones are definitely done. So it's definitely not young. That's obvious. And then it hasn't really followed the pattern we quite expected. And that's largely the position we're in here. It's got some things which we'd expect to fuse last, fused, and some things that we'd expect to fuse in the middle, not quite done yet. So it's probably not quite done yet because really everything that's finished growing properly, or at least it's now in a very slow growth phase, everything should be fused. So, my, you know, my guess it's, you know, it's 90 plus percent of the way there. But it would have been a bit bigger when it finally got there. The interesting things about it, it's got kind of an intermediate number of teeth. So you've got things like Pterodactylus, <laughs> which has relatively few quite strong teeth, because that's probably a predator of small fish. You've got things like Tenochasma and Nathosaurus, which have up to 100 teeth on each side of the jaw top and Crazy. bottom. So like 400 in total. Oh my goodness. Mad, mad filter feeders. This was off the top of my head, like, you know, tw- 20 each side, top and bottom. And they're relatively small. They're not the big long filter filter feeding ones so the filter feeding ones are expecting long teeth that's very sort of like... very long and you know like needles as well so very long and thin and the idea is that they'd take a big sort of gulp of water and all the little fish or little creatures would get stuck in there and it'd squeeze out the water and then it'd swallow it yeah so you, you can suck water into your mouth and push the water back out which yeah. is what whales do or you can suck the water in through the teeth and then kind of process off what's on the teeth by licking your teeth like that um well usually just like letting it drop off okay. and there was a paper on this for pterosaurs oh about four months ago can't remember which they've said it was <laughs> i'd have to go and read it again <laughs> this one your 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 one whose name petro i can't even petrodactyl petro petro i could say petro it's like yeah, Pedro, Pedro, but as Pedro. In, yeah, stone. Yes, as in rock, yeah, as in yeah. petrology, yes. Yeah, so 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 this one's got little nubby teeth, so th- does that mean it's just basically using as many teeth as it can to catch something that's wiggling? Yeah, so it's it's so it's so got two bony crests on its head. Um, mm. One is at the back, and it's a kind of little fan shape, and that's 
basically muscle support. We've got a few other oh, cool. telecasmatids who are pretty big, powerful biters, and they have the same thing. It attaches a bunch of muscles that helps you close your draw, jaw strongly, strong bite, good for breaking things up. So it's got that, but then its teeth aren't that big and aren't that strong, but then its crest at the back of the head isn't that big. So our suggestion was it's, you know, something kind of intermediate. It's got a relatively powerful bite for its size, but it's not a big, crunchy biter. So we said small fish, maybe smaller kind of derms shrimp because some of them can you know can they actually be quite hard cased and and stuff like that but i'm sure they'd hoover up worms and cuttlefish and things like that if they could but it's not saying what a crocodile would do or something where it grabs on and doesn't let go until your prey's exhausted no nothing nothing like that this is a long thin skull with relatively small teeth the other big thing that it's got is it's got a crest at the front of its head oh. loads and loads of pterosaurs have it's absolutely massive in petrodactyl so it was dug up in Germany, I think something like 10 years or so ago. If you know where to look on the internet, there are photos of it out there because it did the rounds as one of these dug up specimens sitting in a museum or sitting in a private collection for a while. And some photos kind of escaped for want of a better phrase. But you can't Google the name because it hadn't been named then. Yes. And, it, and so it's listed as a thing called Ardiodactylus, which is from the Solon often and is a big, big headed Tina Casbity. And it is really quite similar to Ardiodactylus, but it isn't. What Ardidactylus doesn't have actually is a crest on the head. It's one of the few tenacasmuses that doesn't. And Petrodactyl has a massive one. Um, and when it was dug up, it was nicknamed Elvis because it's got this huge thing coming off its head and then kind of curving forwards out over its nose. And it's one of those super fine grained, like stripy ones that we know is an attachment point for soft tissues. So it's oh, already wow. got a very large bony crest on its head, and then the soft tissue crest would have been even larger. So it would have been you know like a proper almost like semi-circle you know covering the whole head i'm thinking of like a roman helmet sort of thing you know with the because we mentioned roman so now i've got yeah, no, that, that, that kind of thing yeah a brush yeah pretty much sticking up and forward and then out and probably about halfway two-thirds of the way down the skull do you think that's why you know partly to shut the jaw but is that what that crest is doing at the back just so it can support its head because flesh is heavy no the the, the, the back crest we we know it articulates with certain muscle attachments and it's not going to be useful for holding the head up because that's a different muscle group on the neck okay um, so this is yeah that, that that's the the rear crest is definitely a biting one the top crest is uh, you know obviously your classic probable sexual display and sociosexual dominance yeah you're dr david hone you're gonna say it's social display you always yeah, do of that. course i am yeah, yeah, yeah. so i can have that argument again as well we <laughs> covered that in a relatively recent episode um so yeah it's i mean in that regard as a gestalt it's perhaps not that exciting you know even though this is my own research and it's very cool and it's nice to name a new species and it's a really nice specimen it's another tina casmatid and we've got loads of them it's a fairly close relative of a bunch of others that we already know about and it is bigger than all but a couple of specimens full stop and then it's probably got a bit more growth to go so it's certainly going to be right up there and he's arguably the biggest thing in the Solnhofen or would have been at full size so that's really quite a nice discovery and the other thing is it's from the Mornsheim formation which I really hope I'm saying right because my German is absolutely so m o umlaut r e s h e i m i think mornsheim no there's an n in there anyway anyway um which is a bit of yeah so it's a bit of the Solnhofen, which really hasn't been dug anything like as much as a bunch of the more classic localities and so this i think is going to be the start of a trend which is being slightly cheeky because i know there's some other stuff come out of there already where i think there's a whole bunch more ready to come in the relatively near future because yes we've got 200 plus Ramphorhynchus, we've got 30 or 40 Pterodactylus, we have got half a dozen Nathosaurus, we've got a couple of dozen Tinochasma, there's two or three Ardiodactylus. These are all things we've been digging up for hundreds and hundreds of years quite literally at this point. The modern time hasn't been dug very much and there's a whole bunch of non pterosaur taxa have been named in relatively recent years coming out of it because people are starting to dig there it's a little younger than everything else perhaps rather unsurprisingly there Therefore, it's got at least a partially, if not fairly different fauna. In other words, most of the stuff you're going to dig up is probably new. So this this really is likely to be the first of many because, not almost everything, but you know, lots and lots of specimens are coming out there now that they're digging a lot more in that area.
area. And this is stuff that just simply hasn't been dug up before. That's cool. I was literally thinking, so this might not be a big one. We might see they might have gone through a later spurt of getting bigger. This is the thing, you know, at least some of the things that have been dug up there are fairly large examples or larger specimens on average. Is there some kind of preservational bias going on, which is favouring some of the larger specimens, when we certainly think in Solnhof and Classic, it's probably favouring smaller stuff. But you you always say, or you have said, that, you know, over time species do trend to become bigger. The trend is that they will. Yeah, is this a slightly larger version of an existing lineage? Yeah, that's perfectly possible. I mean, that that's one of those, we're speculating a bit and we won't really know to be dug up a lot more, but when you just look at the first few things, it's like, well, this is notable that they're quite big and they're all new. That's probably, there's probably a reason for that. Um, so let's keep an eye on it. Is there a way of telling? Because I know that animals like turkeys have fleshy attachments to their faces and stuff. Admittedly, they don't have the crest that they're on. But they seem to sort of have some sort of control as to how long or, or contracted that they get. Well, for some of them they can. Yeah, tragopans in particular, like completely unfurl this giant thing from their chest and then it just like ro- literally rolls back up under their chin. It's amazing. Is there any way of telling if, you know, the crest on top of this pterosaur has a similar function? Is there is there an obvious way to... Because it might be that... that oh, you I wouldn't can see hold your breath. No, to, no, no, it's just nothing like that at all, unfortunately. So we could have, you know, a big floppy dangler that when it's when it's trying to look exciting and it just covers well, its entire I mean, people head. Have, people have drawn them like that and, you know, it doesn't tend to turn up on seabirds, but there are those lappet-faced waders whose name escapes who They have these big yellow pendulous things down the, either side of their beak from under their eyes. Bright yellow, little little brown and black bird about foot high. It looks like it's crying. Yes, but with giant yellow <laughs> flaps dangling off its face. Oh, bless. As ever, who knows? Though, based on what we do know about the soft tissue structure, I, yeah, that's not one I'd be looking out for. The other thing I was going to talk about is, yeah, is the kind of origin of this specimen. And again, Rene and Bruce, my collaborators on this. So I mentioned, you know, there's photos of this specimen because it was dug up in a private quarry and was owned by one of the, frankly, innumerable Solenhofen fossil owners and dealers. And, you know, a lot of these quarry owners now own them and mine them commercially for their fossils. And we've had lots of discussion and talk on the podcast at various times about the issues surrounding private ownership and how does private ownership work and what does that mean for fossils and accessibility and bloody, 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 blah. Which brings me to Rene Bruce. So they bought this specimen and they have a foundation, the Lauer Foundation for uh, it's PSE, so Paleontology, Science and Education. So people immediately are going to look at that and go, well, hang on, that sounds awfully like they bought this private specimen, they've taken it into their private collection and that's a private specimen. And I thought paleontologists tried to avoid working on private specimens, which is all true, except this foundation has been set up by them very carefully and specifically to effectively be a public institute. And that was really important. And, uh, you know, I first contacted them years ago because I'd heard about their collection, was speaking to them about this, and it took ages to get this all set up. And I think it's very notable. Um, I won't drop names per se, um, but we've definitely mentioned, you know, the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology, this big international society. And I wouldn't say they're necessarily driving it, but they're kind of at the forefront of how we as a community discuss fossils and what we're doing with them. And of course, their publication arm is JVP, the Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology. And I will say that I do know that an editor, in fact, a head editor of JVP and a former chair of SVP were instrumental in helping Rene and Bruce with the paperwork to make sure that the foundation met the standards of JVP and SVP for basically foundation status and public access of the fossils and therefore accessible for research and accessible for publication. So although they, they have bought this specimen from a private collector, they have it has gone into the foundation, not their personal vault, and that <laughs> makes it available. Well, but it is this really important distinction, and I'm not the first person to publish with them or on their collection. They have some other papers out already. I know they have other stuff. They've presented stuff at conferences, including the SVP conference with their material, but I think simply because there's only been a couple of those and they've mostly been smaller things, this is certainly going to be the first time loads of people have heard of them and discovered what they have and what they're doing and this kind of whole foundation for research. And it's really centred around Solnhofen material. That's a large chunk of what they have in their collection. And the reason I think to oversimplify it is basically you need to study fossils and use fossils in science which are then accessible to other scientists so that they can make sure that what you've concluded is accurate. Yes, 
basically. Yeah. That really is it. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. I could write a dinosaur paper. I've got this amazing fossil, Dave, but you're not allowed to see it. So yeah, and and that is exa- and that is exactly the problem with this stuff. Um, in this case, there's also they had a cast made, and that's been deposited back in Germany. So Munich, in the the old BSPG, the Verein State Col- Collection for Paleontology, where I used to work many years ago, has a cast of it. So there is at least another copy knocking around, which is kind of nice. I, more people should cast things and I send know, them was, to I was other institutes. Ask, who makes the casts? Is this a thing that paleontologists do, or is there a special like group of people who goes round? I mean, a bit know. of everything, really. I mean, I I know how to do it. I haven't made a decent one in years, and I don't have the material. I'd have to I'd have to read up on it again. Um, but you know, most museums will do that job. You know, their their preparators and their curators will have that skill set and have the materials available and will run them. But again, they're also commercial people. You know, I have lots of casts of dinosaur fossils in my office that I've bought for my outreach and engagement program, and that requires buying casts or fossils. And I'd rather have cast and 3D prints or sculpts because they are a true representation at some level. Um, so yeah, so there are some commercial groups that do that. Or there's people like RCI Research Casting International up in Canada who do it commercially. You know, they, they, they basically get commissions from museums to fix things. So Berlin, when they dismantled their entire dinosaur hall and put it back together, they paid RCI to do that. I know they did Zool. They did the preparation and the mounting of and the casting of Zool for the Royal Ontario for Museum. For those, those confused who haven't heard of Zool before, it's an ankylosaur, not actually from Ghostbusters, but paleontologists are children, therefore named it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Dave is nodding. Dave is nodding. Yeah, of course. <laughs> great name. And it, it looks a, great. And it looks a bit like the monster dogs from yeah. Ghostbusters, which is why it it's does. Zool. It does. So yeah, so that that kind of stuff goes on a fair bit. But as I say, this is I mean, I I can't think of anything really comparable to what they have because there are other foundations like this, but they usually just buy stuff and donate it straight to the museum. You know, you can you know you can go to big institutes and there'll be this fossil was bought by or this hall was paid for by or this collection is sponsored by. And this is rather different in the sense that they're building up this collection and making it directly available. But they're actively engaged in the stuff themselves as well. So again, you know, I think we have talked a bit about authorship on paper papers in the past and contributions and da 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 Have a name beginning with A. That's the key. Yes, yeah. Uh, Anon is a good, great name to have as it's well. It's amazing. It gets you some extra citation. So Renee is a phenomenal photographer, just in general. I mean, her wildlife photos are jaw-dropping and I'm extremely jealous of her talent as well as and her I'm photograph je- I'm jealous collection. of your... Yeah, like Dave puts up loads of like pictures of stuff he's taken in zoos and it looks like a zoo catalogue half the time. Puts them on Facebook and just shows off. I'm just... Yeah, <laughs> I do that. I do that, jealous. but just go to zoo though it's not that difficult i did take an amazing picture of a snail yesterday of it's climbing up its own shell i, d- I think it was a bad move for it but anyway. yeah but yeah it's, it sounds a bit lost uh, that yeah. may not be a long-term good plan no. um as i had been saying, sorry so yeah ren ren is a superb photographer full stop um but also we've definitely mentioned helmut tischlinger over the years helmut a german i was going to say academic but he's he's not german uh, helmut was a was an was a school teacher um who was mad interested that in fossils because academia. he lives in he lives in bavaria this is a fairly common pathway. We've mentioned people like this before. He got into fossils. He got into the Solenhofen because that's where he based. And he's ended up publishing multiple papers on the Solenhofen fauna and is an author on dozens of papers, including a couple with me. He was given an honorary doctorate by the University of Munich for his contributions to science. Not one of those, we've got someone famous to turn up to give out the degree, so we had to give them an honorary doctorate to get them through the door. This is an actual honorary doctorate for doing doctorate at level work uh, and being given one um, and Helmer in particular is famous for his UV photographer photography and use of UV lights to reveal hidden details like soft tissues and not just wing membranes and, and claws but you know things like gut and scales and you know collagen fibres and not just pterosaurs though because he famously my community pterosaurs but you know fish and, and reptiles and all kinds of other stuff and Rene has learnt um, with Helmer and Rene and Bruce have worked with Helmer extensively and she has, or they have, their their own massive custom-built rig of all these UV lights and lamps in different filters and this, that, and the other. And boy, can you find some detail on these things when you have that. And so Rene, unsurprisingly, did all the UV work on the paper. Fully open access, so anyone can see it, anyone can read it, and you can see all the images. Really beautiful stuff with loads and loads of details highlighted. I just want to get into this because I don't think I understand. Why would you get more detail with you? Because I know that UV light is basically like the 
the the spectrum that we see, all the colours of yeah. the spectrum we see, is is a slower wavelength. That's how I'll put it. It's a slower wavelength yes. than UV, which is right up by the. You know, we can't physically see it with our eyes, but well, cameras, it's ultra because it's beyond our vision. Yeah, exactly. That's... So so it's really like a speeded up wavelength. Why does that allow you to see in more detail? I don't understand. So it's basically because you know all surfaces of anything reflect certain wavelengths at certain ways and some of them are good at some things and some of them are bad at others and so if you really limit that light you know like when you just get like a red beam or a red bulb and your whole room looks kind of weird because obviously all the green plants go black because they're really good at absorbing red so nothing bounces back you're kind of just doing the same thing you're playing around with what is reflecting and what isn't reflecting and if you find the right balance of these you'll get reflectance from stuff which either isn't visible in natural light full stop or is a lot more visible under uv when you get this contrast between the bones and the matrix and the soft tissue that you're looking for okay so it's basically just like fiddling with um like when you turn your photos to black and white and someone you see all of your freckles and horribleness and in the other ones you look really smooth skinned and lovely not quite but but it's that sort of thing okay yeah it's it's yeah you're blocking some frequencies and exaggerating others and if you do that in certain combinations then a feature that might be there but is very low reflectance next to something that's very bright suddenly becomes very bright next to something that's very low and then it goes from being invisible to sticking out like a sore thumb excellent thank you that that makes me feel less stupid yes <laughs> and as i was saying yes yeah, so already done all the photography for this and uh, that's really helped find out various things so despite we had quite a lot of detail on what the preparators had done to the fossil you're finding out places that's had glue on it places that's had restoration bits where the bones really thin and you can see some of the minerals underneath oh. there is some soft tissue stuff in there which is showing up under uv that wasn't showing up under natural light and just in general the bones and teeth because the bones are quite gray on a quite gray background and when that becomes kind of glowing orangey green on a <laughs> on a black background they show up rather better basically you know and things like joints and when you've got cracks and breaks alongside joints again you know just focusing and highlighting those differences it all makes it easier to work uh, so really did that side of things and then bruce for for his side and his contribution to this paper basically tracked down the history of the damn thing because it does look like it bounced between two or three different people before it reached them and so finding out exactly where it got dug up when and we have got down eventually tracked down the original person who dug it up and got the gps coordinates oh, and a photograph good. of the specimen in the hillside or at least them levering the block out of the hillside with reference points to other bits of the quarry because this is a problem not just for historical specimens but even new ones like this you know someone dug it up and it just says Songhofen area or it will say Eichstatt quarry and you go oh okay I know the Eichstatt quarry is 200 square meters and about 20 meters deep so where <laughs> <laughs> you know that's probably half a million years top to exactly bottom. <laughs> that's why it matters is because you've got to date it and you can't date it any other way than working out where in the strata it comes from yeah so so bruce being able to eventually hunt that guy down and get that information out so we've got the quarry locality data we've got the horizon data we've got a photo of it on situ we've got the gps coordinates yeah that's really rather important um for exactly also, I imagine that consideration that's, that's a lot of actually speaking to people which was science is hard. Uh, yes. 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 It's, it's, it's tricky. I mean, I say that the only way of dating these specimens is where they lie in the strata, the horizons, etc. Is that true? Is there that? Because obviously you can't do radiocarbon dating or anything else because it's. Well, so we do we do isotopic dating, but okay. as I think we've covered before, that relies on there basically being volcanic outputs. Uh, um, so what you're also then doing is relative dating, depending on how high or low it is, but we also have biomarkers. And so this is where the science Hopper does quite well because it's got lots of ammonites and ammonites have this really nice phenomenon whereby they seem to evolve quite rapidly and spread very widely but then go extinct and are replaced which means that what you tend to get is ammonites a b and c appear all over the world at this time and then they're all gone and replaced by d e and f at this time Amazing. and so wherever you go if you find ammonite b or ammonite f you know roughly what layer you're in and what age you are and the song Hoffman being a a lagoonal system of an archipelago uh, in shallow, warm seas is heaving with ammonite. 
absolutely heaving with them. They're so common there, people don't really collect them. I'm trying to think if there's an Archaeopteryx with an ammonite on it. Probably. There's definitely several pterosaurs with ammonites, not on the fossil, but like in the same layer that you've just lifted up. So if you can identify that ammonite species, you know exactly what layer you're in. I'm just going to sort of like as well, because occasionally we do have people who might not know what an ammonite is. They're the swirly ones. So they're, what, they're the swirly, and they look like snails, but they're not snails. They're more like octopus, aren't they? Yeah, they're, they're cephalopods. So exactly. they're part of squid, cuttlefish, octopus group. Uh, and nautilus, which is what they look most like. They're, they are a part of that bigger group of nautiloids, ammonoids and nautiloids. So a spirally shell and then lots of little tentacles and a pair of eyes and sticking out the end. they get massive. Oh, yeah, the big ones are like six foot across. Absolutely enormous. So, yeah, and and if you look at fossil catalogues of or, or um, geological section maps of the Solnhofen, it will often say like ammonite layer species X, ammonite layer species Y. So you really can trace the ages of things through the ammonites, which is really, really nice. Assuming you find them, because of course you don't always, and again, as I say, there's loads of not just historical, even modern specimens, which it just says this area. Though again, modern is this relative term it you know in the sense that you implies you dug it up a couple of years ago but someone might have dug it up a century ago and it's literally sat in a drawer it's only just appeared on the market that appears to be what happened with the thermopolis archaeopteryx so the one that went to thermopolis in the u.s is that i believe it was sold through switzerland and the rumor was it it had been there for at least a century you know he had literally sat in the vault of a swiss bank with whatever family owned it waiting for the right time or when they needed the money and then it suddenly appeared and for everyone this is a new specimen there's a new specimen that's been sitting around for a hundred years oh my goodness it's so frustrating the song is where we got you know that's obviously where we found the first pterosaurs but it's also yep. one of the first times that you know that when paleontology really sort of started to kick off that's basically where people were going for their specimens as well so well, for been... a lot of it yeah so yeah. because it was accessible and in central europe and you know it wasn't people were already digging it up for other reasons and so it was relatively easy to find stuff but you know you the the big collectors you you know you'd travel around you know that kind of grand tour would be doing the same thing and visiting all of the major sites but certainly it was bringing up some of the most important stuff and you know archaeopteryx is first among equals you know darwin writing in his letter this is a magnificent discovery that fully vindicates me is some he's probably wanted to write for a while um after after origin came out yeah so yeah that's pretty much it i have to finish quickly by mentioning freddie Moore because there was another collaborator and really helped on the german side of things and in some beautiful illustrations of the paper and sky mcdavid who i think we mentioned before because sky did the illustrations for my um sternum paper and she also did the kind of um skeletal reconstruction of the animal for the paper which is really important that makes it look nice but yeah it's it's a big collaboration as almost all papers are these days but obviously Rene and bruce have this fantastic foundation they've put a ton of money into it they have loads of cool fossils they're inviting collaborators i was lucky enough to be an invited collaborator and i got to work on this really 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 cool terrace and name it after somebody who hadn't had a pterosaur named after them, despite working in pterosaurs. I, I, I mean, I, I'm genuinely, genuinely still baffled by the fact that no one had done it before. Arguably, I should have done one named Bella Brutus, but then I, I, I had the species name imposed on me in that case. Well, um, let's let's let, let's do the top jump card. So wingspan, we got wingspan two meters. We've got massive head crest, ten points for that. I think. When are we talking here? Because you said late Jurassic, Tithonian, but. I never know what the Tithonian is. Would you say it's Tithonian? That sounds cool. Yeah, okay, fine. It's Tithonian in age. It's Tithonian, which we all if know you, what you that know means, that, guys. We, yeah. I think, I think, Google it. Yeah, Google it. How about, Be- how people, about Dave? People ask me stuff like this and go, how old is the Tithonian? And it's like, I'm going to have to Google it to find out. So I don't know why you haven't done it I yourself. Think, I, think, I think, Dave, that when it comes to writing the show notes... You can Google it and include it. Yeah, it's like your pterosaur, <laughs> and you should know. Um, found in the Song of in Germany, and just an awesome creature from the sound of it. Oh, have we only got this one specimen, or is this the one that proves the rule? Have we got other ones? No, other it's, 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 it's the only one so far. I've I've seen photos of some other stuff that's come out that looks very similar, but you'd want to take a really close close look at it because it, it is close to several other things, and so you do 
have to start looking at the real subtleties. Fair enough. And have you got any more in your back pocket that are coming out soon? Well, so it's the other one, I, I'm not the lead author, so I was on Petrodactyl, but the other one's um, led by a guy called Zi Xiao Wang. Hopefully I'm getting that right. And my Chinese pronunciation usually isn't too bad. Zi Xiao, um, he did his PhD with Mike Benton, and now he's in Cork in Ireland. And I did a paper or helped out him and his research team with a paper on aneurygnathids and aneurygnathid growth a year or two ago. I can't remember. Aneurygnathids are the little cute ones. They're cute little ones. The little cute furry ones with the big eyes. They are in they are indeed. The ones who hug mugs. You know, this paper I think is a classic example of a scientist being led by evidence because they contacted me and said, Hey, we're we're working on this paper on pterosaur growth and looking at that and what it means for rearing of offspring. And I looked at it and I went, Oh you 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 can't correlate that I, I can't even begin to think how you try and correlate that and i don't know of any mechanism that that would work and so i'm like right so i don't think that you can correlate the two things you say you're going to correlate so okay send it over and i'll have a look and by the time i finished reading it going this is brilliant <laughs> what, a great, <laughs> what a great idea <laughs> skepticism yeah, overcome it, it, yeah but, but basically yeah so in in terms of the analysis that i thought was a bit ropey they'd improved it and i was think i was able to help them improve prove it further um and it was about basically looking at wing shape and wing area versus mass and what that means for flight characteristics and what that means for development that seems fair I think it was one of those sledgehammer to crack a nut papers, as in... Oversimplified. Well, no, the opposite. Oh, massively overcomplicating okay. a very, very simple correlation that you don't need to. But this one now has taken into account wing shape, which the previous one didn't, which is obviously quite important. Um, and so it, I think it means that our analyses, they're still massively broad. We have dodgy size estimates. We have dodgy... Not dodgy. We have big error on our size estimates and wingspan estimates and wing area estimates. And therefore, any calculation about flight is going to have big error bars on it and the short version is so we've got four animals the aneurygnathids we've had to take as a group but we already have that analysis pterodactylus so a small tina casmatid rampharynchus a relatively large non-pterodactyloid and pteranodon really famous animal that gets up to six seven meters so you've got small and big early ones in aneurygnathids and rampharynchus and then small and big derived ones in pterodactylus and pteranodon Massive. yeah and then basically trying to extend their growth trajectories up and down so again listeners may you remember I did a big paper on Ramphorhynchus a couple of years ago looking at this with 150, 180 specimens and doing a complete growth trajectory and going, hey, Ramphorhynchus is basically isometric. Babies out of the egg have essentially identical proportions to adults. Crazy. So they, they grow as this very, very, you know, very unusual. You know, babies usually have big heads and big feet and small bodies and that's what babies of just about everything look like, you know, from fish to humans. Pterosaurs, or at least Ramphorhynchus, didn't seem to do that. But what Ishiel's done CZL has done is try to extend this. So it's at, at one level, it's obviously really artificial. Pterodactylus didn't get above about you know one meter twenty, one meter thirty. We've carried on its growth trajectory to see what it would look like if it was a pteranodon, and equally we've taken pteranodon and shrunk it all the way down to a baby Enuricnathus. Um, which sounds frivolous, but the idea is to try and look at these trajectories and basically see are these animals functional at different sizes and what happens with these different growth trajectories. And the short version is is that they do have different growth trajectories and that Ramphorhynchus may not be unique um, but certainly it's not like all pterosaurs are growing isometrically in the case of pteranodon we've got something closer to more traditional allometric growth of various bits of its wings and body and what that means for its flight and this is why we're tracing these lines up and down and the reason that then connects to rearing is isometric animals and this is again my paper and again others isn't not that it was my idea isometric animals are isometric flying animals are usually precocial they are capable of flying very soon after hatching and allometric growth animals in other words where different bits grow at different speeds where they start off all cute with big heavy feet so they can't usually, take off yes but it, it but it depends so you get you get things you get almost the inverse of that so you think get things like baby deer which are like all leg because they have to be able to run very very soon they're precocious in that sense but they still have allometric growth of the rest of them to then catch up. So Pteranodon at least it looks like it's on this allometric trajectory, which would indicate that young ones didn't fly very well, if at all. Wow. In other words, mum and dad, or at least parents of some description, were looking after them. 
So that's the big kind of takeaway is inferring parental care from growth trajectory. It's clever that. It is clever that. that yeah, is which clever. is why I didn't think they could do it <laughs> until the paper <laughs> explained it. And then I went, you can do that. Uh, and, and, and actually it was really neat because it's gone to um, Proceedings of the Royal Society, uh, which is really quite a good journal. Uh, and it got three, if not four ref- reviews, which is quite a lot. You, you know, you normally get two, you sometimes get three. You only normally get four when either people are late and they had to go to someone else and then the original ones came in anyway or where the editor's really not sure what to do with it because the referees two say it's brilliant and two say it's terrible and they keep trying to get more opinions in and what we actually had was yeah three i think i think four referee reports and three of them were really good and even the one that was bad just said i just don't understand this and i worry that too much hinges on this calculation and you need to check it and try and do a couple of other things to see if it's stable when you mess around with the devalues so we did we did a whole extra extra suite of analyses on it under their instruction sent it back and literally it came back about a week later because they the, the editor clearly only sent it to that referee and he went this is great and we're like oh, oh for we, four. yeah 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 we, we, we were just expecting you know another five pages of and you need to change that and i don't believe and have you checked this measurement and that scaling looks wrong and therefore you're concluding look no <laughs> like, Fantastic. What, the, the only one who had any problem with it at all went yeah brilliant well done i like that because it convinced you first so technically it's five for five really <laughs> yeah. you know just as a concept well that's before i rewrote it <laughs> well yes but still but still you know it, it all counts it must be an investigation that isn't it it's very agatha christie but re- re- you know, really interesting stuff and of course going forward that has potential implications for the sort of stuff i've been talking about for years in terms of sexual selection and sexual dimorphism because of course pteranodon is one of those few pterosaurs where we're fairly happy that males and females look quite different with big males with big crests and small females without them so yeah there's there's lots going on there this i should say you know this is not an obvious blanket all the small ones were were precocious and all the big ones were um reliant on parental care and again we're we're in bigger gray areas here but pteranodon is definitely over on one side and things like ramphorinkas are definitely over on the other side i i know that we've been looking for pterosaur nests and t- we've seen that they've got well, we have a handful yeah um well at least we have we have quite we so we had a handful of isolated eggs and in the last few years we've had one from Brazil and one from Western China with large clusters of eggs but they're not in nests so they're, they're egg fields that have been you know mixed up and mixed with bones and are, and are preserved together um, but again at least it gives us something to work from the, the, the Chinese one in particular there's so many fossils and they're all disarticulated and if we just had half a dozen intact adults I think we could do a lot with that but they don't seem to be out there yet I was about to ask a question about about, like clutch size and whether that indicates parental stuff but then i remember blue tits can get up to 20 eggs in the same clutch and you're just like okay fair enough and also it's more to do with like the female being able to fly with that many eggs inside her as well i suppose well the blue tits they grow one a day but yeah. it's the, the the question is what is the limit so yeah thing small birds typically lay the number of eggs that they think they can reasonably rear um which is why you know all the big predatory birds usually just go for two um because the what they have to do to hunt and catch stuff and yada 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 whereas uh things that you know don't look after the eggs can just lay low blue-footed boobies always two and one kills the other yeah but then but then there's also splits even in that because maximum reproductive output you know you might have like a hundred units uh, and you could maybe lay a hundred one unit eggs or 10 10 unit eggs and what's the survivability of those different things going to be so even if you're not sticking parental care in you know you might do better with a few big eggs than lots of small ones and that sort of thing is still hard to tell because really the bigger the egg the more developed the um it will be yeah and, you know, and just uh, ju- and just straight up the fewer predators can eat it you know oh, yeah, a very true. very hatchling small baby bird is going to be vulnerable to ants and spiders and things like this Beetles. whereas if it's five times the size it just isn't and that you know that will always be an effect there's a hell of a lot to go with pterosaurs and the data is sparse even by fossil record standards but this is i think a really quite good example of what you kind of have to do when your data is that limited and how you can develop workarounds which are obviously not ideal but really allow us to start chipping away at some of those problems and say so it's petro say the last bit again petrodactyl petrodactyl look 
but the other Velnhoferite. Velnhoferite. Velnhofer. Peter Velnhofer. Velnhofer. Nice. W e double l n h o f e r. I don't think that's going to make Sesame Street. I'm sorry, but well, it's quite a hard one for the kids. But uh, we uh, <laughs> uh, 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 yeah. <laughs> that's counting, not not alphabet. Anyway, well, thank you so much, Dr. Dinto, for telling us all about Petrodactylus Velnhoferi. Dactyl Velnhoferi. Ah, oh, so close. Petrodactyl Velhoferi. I'm not going to get a single congratulations for managing to say a word. Anyway, um, it sounds, it's it sounds your amazing. <laughs> it's I'm, your three goes. I'm really bad. I'm really not good at pronouncing stuff and people want me to. And it's anyway. So uh, we will be back. Uh, hopefully we'll be back next month. If not, we might release an emergency episode that I've got in my back pocket simply because Dave's moving house. And that's quite a lot for a Dave to, to cope with. But hopefully we'll see you next month. If not, um, please do catch up on old episodes on our Patreon. Uh, Patreon.com forward slash Terrible Lizards. Or go to terriblelizards.co.uk to listen to all of our back episodes. And even check out other podcasts like I Know Dino. Just simply because they've got a great name. Other than that, should we say, oh, it's a squawker, isn't it? It's not a rar. Yay. <laughs> you loves it. You loves it. So after three, your best flappy flap squawk. One, two, three. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for listening to Terrible Lizards. For extra content, please go to patreon.com forward slash terrible lizards. For questions, contact us there or on terriblelizardspod at gmail.com. Buy Dave Hone's dinosaur books, including How Fast a T Rex Run, and to find out about Izzy's podcasts and books, head to iszi.com. Say hello on social media using the hashtag terrible lizards. Thank you so much for listening. A review, a recommend and a follow makes all the difference. Stay stompy.